So we're happy to start our morning session with Chris Hackers, who will tell us, uh, he'll give the last lecture about uh, black holes and quantum error corrections. Thank you. Okay. Um, this is possibly going to be my favorite of the four lectures because it uh, brings us up to very modern material on this topic. So what we learned in the first two lectures was about, um, you know, some historical ways of thinking about reconstruction. And we saw that there was this theorem that we called theorem one that told us uh, there's this tight connection between the quantum extremal surface formula and reconstruction. So if you know, um, given some, say, CFT subregion B, possibly that's the whole CFT, you can learn what you can reconstruct on B by looking at where its quantum extremal surface is. And it can reconstruct operators in the entanglement wedge, is what it's called. Um, but that theorem had this assumption of the fixed QES subspace, which we learned last time we shouldn't be fully satisfied with because there are interesting questions to ask, like about evaporating black holes, that don't fit into these fixed QES subspaces. Different states in the subspace we're interested in have different quantum extremal surfaces. Um, and, but then we dealt with this problem by seeing that there's a theorem two, which generalizes theorem one by just lifting this assumption of the fixed QES subspace. And so this, the existence of theorem two confirms for us that we can still use the quantum extremal surface formula to learn in principle what is and is not reconstructible. I didn't emphasize this point, but it's important that theorem two, just like theorem one, has this if and only if between this quantum extremal surface and this reconstruction. So it's not just telling you, you can reconstruct all of the stuff in the entanglement wedge. It's telling you, you can't do more. So like, you know, if, you, if you could reconstruct something that it, it's not, if you could reconstruct something outside the entanglement wedge, um, that would be saying like one, that condition one um, has a very large little b. The theorem would tell you that therefore that larger little b should be the region that we're calling the entanglement wedge. So theorem two told us exactly what you can and can't reconstruct, uh, but it was a little hard to just read off all the interesting physics from it because the operators you could reconstruct were a little uh, obscure. They were these like product unitaries that worked on the state psi, um, but that's life. That's the that's the theory, that's the theorem about reconstruction that we have so far. Um, and so, in principle, the program now would be take this theorem and say compute the quantum extremal surface of various regions, like the CFT when the black hole is in uh, various states. And knowing that information, combining it with theorem two, you could learn exactly the operators that you can and can't reconstruct on the CFT. Um, and I would like to be able to tell you exactly uh, that data now, but that's very hard and no one has done it. So that's not the story that I'm about to tell you. But even though that's hard, uh, there's something qualitative and very important that we have learned uh, since then from this line of thought. And that's the following. So first let me emphasize something that we learned from theorem two that's, um, that's very nice. So as we saw last time, we were talking about the evaporating black hole which, you know, this is an evaporating black hole in ADS, and we might draw its Penner's diagram like so. You know, maybe there's some dust ball that collapsed to form this black hole. Remember, this is R equals zero on the left, and then this is the asymptotic boundary. And then this is the singularity. The dashed line is the horizon. This goes down to minus infinity in time. Um, and we coupled it to a, a reservoir, which I could draw, 
I could draw like this. This is often how it's drawn, where it's literally just drawn like some, it's a non-gravitational flat space region. So it's, since it's flat space, this is its Penrose diagram. It's like this triangle. Um, and I'm, I'm just drawing it sort of already glue, glued to the uh, asymptotic boundary. So this really emphasizes this idea that um, some, some mode passing radially outwards and hitting the boundary would just sort of pass through and enter this flat space region. So this way of drawing it uh, is just reminding us that they're sort of defined with boundary conditions that relate them in this way. And remember, this allowed the black hole to evaporate because these uh, outside Hawking modes just pass through, don't get reflected back into the black hole, and therefore the black hole loses energy over time. And what, what we saw was that if we, say, take some state, so by this orange dot, I mean, this, I want to talk about a time slice of the CFT at a late time, so after the black hole has been evaporating for a long time. Um, and you know, maybe there's a, t there's a time slice of the bulk that I might consider that it's like this orange line, and that's sort of a dual, on this orange line there's a dual state to this CFT state. Um, we saw that if I want to compute the von Neumann entropy of the CFT at this time, It's given by, of course, the quantum extremal surface formula. But with, but with a gamma that changes over time. So at early times, so I could, draw, I could draw this probably better with colors. So say if you tried to compute the von Neumann entropy of blue, the blue time in the CFT, it was given by uh, this quantum extremal surface that's like the trivial quantum extremal surface. Gamma didn't exist. And then uh, the only contribution came from this SB term, which really just picked up whatever Hawking modes are on this blue slice at this time. But, the, but at this later time, after the so-called page time, uh, we're now call it like orange B to, to represent that we're talking about the CFT at this time. We saw that, I, I mean, I just claimed to you, I didn't prove it, that there is a, a different quantum extremal surface that nucleates um, it's essentially uh, here, right behind the horizon. And so the, the little b of this orange region is between this dot and this x. So this is little b, whereas down here, little b was everything. And all of these Hawking partners uh, are excluded. So the interior guys, which had a lot of entropy, are, are no longer contributing to S of B. And therefore, um, this term is very small. And then this term was approximately the area of the black hole over 4G Newton. Um, and so there was this transition as time went on from being given by this term to being given by this term. And then that is why you'll see plots called the page curve um, that look something like this, that the entropy is going up and then falling down with time. And then this time is often called the page time. Um, that was, that's a reminder. So, what I want to emphasize is there's some other cool facts you can point out about this situation um, because you know, as the black hole is radiating, there's you know, more and more modes accumulate in this reservoir. So, so an early time slice of the reservoir might look like this. A later time slice might look like this. Um, and so these later time slices have more modes on them, uh, and so therefore, um, you know, that's, the that's just because the radiation is accumulating in the reservoir. And we can ask about the entropy of the radiation, and the upshot is that the entropy of the, you know, the CFT and the radiation are in 
uh, a pure state together, say, if we started this whole thing out in a pure state. So we drew this picture, which sort of combines all of these systems. There was this gravity system, uh, and I was drawing its dual CFT in the same picture with the reservoir. But we should remember that, you know, really, there's two descriptions going on. There's the one that's best given by this drawing, and then there's another, which we might call the CFT description, or the fundamental description. I'm gonna call it the fundamental description, because it's you know, using the CFT, which is in some sense a more fundamental description of the physics than than semi-classical gravity, which is an effective theory. And in this picture, I, I wouldn't draw this. In the CFT description, we would just draw, you know, there's a CFT, um, so this line is just exactly this line. I'm still suppressing the space dimensions. Um, and then the reservoir is, of course, something I would draw like this. Um, but this is still CFT, and this is, and this is, this whole triangle is the reservoir. And so the physics, as described in this picture, is that this, um, <coughs> you know, the CFT is sort of emitting quanta over time. And uh, of course, since the whole thing is in a pure state, it's all in some big state psi, say. This is the state of the CFT and reservoir. Uh, if you at any time compute the entropy of the CFT, which we're calling B here, that will always equal the entropy of the reservoir. I don't know if you've seen this fact before, but this is a general fact about von Neumann entropy, that if you have some pure state that's bipartite, it just has two parts, the von Neumann entropy of one side always equals the von Neumann entropy of the other side. Um, and could prove this, say, um, using the so-called Schmidt decomposition, but we won't try and prove it here. So what this tells you is, is that, um, let's say you were to compute the entropy of R, it would follow uh, the same exact curve and um, well, I don't want to be too pedantic about it. Uh, the upshot is that S of R is also given by this QES formula. Uh, this is one argument for it. There's independent arguments that you should consider S of R to be given by the QES formula as well. Um, but its entanglement wedge is sort of the complementary one. So at early times, at early times, when we're, we were considering some CFT state and what its entanglement, entanglement wedge was, it was the entire time slice of the ADS. At late times, whenever the CFT loses access to this part, so now its entanglement wedge is just this outside part, where does this go? It doesn't just disappear from all entanglement wedges, it becomes the entanglement wedge of the radiation. Um, I, I found this very surprising when I first heard about it because R doesn't have to be a CFT or anything, it's just some system, some quantum system uh, entangled with this holographic CFT and the claim is that uh, you, you can also use the QES formula to compute its entropy and it can have an entanglement wedge that includes part of this ADS spacetime. Um, might seem surprising. Let me not try and argue this um, too carefully. I just want to tell you this so that I can move on to some uh, puzzle that this informs. Yes. Yeah, here, evaporating black hole. 
Yeah. So should I think of the CFD as diminishing in time? Uh, yeah, it's losing information and it's losing energy with time. Yeah. But also not number of degrees of, uh, is it a changing CFT or is it just a okay. fixed CFT? It's uh, just a fixed CFT and it's, it's, it's coupled to the reservoir by some um, like bi-local coupling. I'm at, like some, some operator I'm adding to the Lagrangian of the two systems that just has, it's like little g times O CFT O reservoir. And so it's just coupling them. Uh, and um, the reservoir is very big and very cold, so the CFT is losing energy to the reservoir by this coupling. So uh, maybe this is a very, very simple answer, but um, regarding the page curve that you drew, so my understanding is that that's one of the great motivations behind all of this, because yes. basically the starting state and the final state are both pure because they have von Neumann entropy equal to zero, and this is very nice. But what about all the in-between times? Is it, is, it, is it fine that the von Neumann entropy is fine uh, so that the state is entangled during the process. Yes, yes. So uh, this non-zero entropy in the in between times is, is coming from the entanglement between the CFT and the reservoir. If you were to compute the entropy of the total system, like C CFT union reservoir as a function of time, that would always be zero. Yeah. 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 Great. So the um, so keep this in mind. We're going to come back to it. And maybe it'll even make more sense why I was emphasizing this point um, or what I meant by it. <clears throat> what I want to get to now is that there's sort of a puzzle that's been implicit in this discussion of evaporating black holes um, and what we can reconstruct. And I want to make it explicit. It was a very perplexing puzzle. It bothered me for many years. And I think now we have a better understanding of what's going on. So the puzzle is this. So we said just now that there are sort of two descriptions of the physics of this evaporating black hole. One is given by this picture where you have some ADS space time uh, and the boundary conditions are such that it can lose uh, Hawking modes into the reservoir. The other one didn't involve gravity. It was just a CFT coupled to the reservoir. These are just two descriptions that are related by the ADS-CFT dictionary. And so, you know, as before, as always, we imagine we have some linear map V which maps ADS states to CFT states. That was, that, this is sort of our starting point. Um, but what's happening is that, wait, this is a, a very important claim I mentioned it in the uh, discussion section yesterday because there was a question about it, but I, I need to say it now too. So the claim is that if you think about these two pictures and what's going on with this evaporation process, we're going to learn something very surprising about V and about reconstruction. The claim is that, uh, you know, at least at late times, in this evaporating black hole process, the, uh, there are more states well, I'll say this way. There are more, yeah. There's a larger there's more degrees of freedom in the black hole interior than, uh, than the CFT is using to describe that state.
This is the claim. And so um, a little more concretely, well, I'll write an equation in a second. What I mean is, at this time, um, well, let me write some equation. So what I mean is, if you were to look at the CFT state as a function of time, uh, you know, this is some CFT state, uh, and in the bulk, there's some black hole. <clears throat> and you can ask, um, you know, maybe the CFT state is something that uh, looks thermalized, <clears throat> um, and, you know, CFTs have infinitely many degrees of freedom, but the, the CFT Hilbert space is, of course, infinite, <clears throat> but, <clears throat> excuse me, it has support not on the entire Hilbert space. You know, it, some thermal state perhaps has support on the entire Hilbert space, but you can, not, you can truncate that to some finite subspace of the CFT uh, without changing the state very much. Or alternatively, we could just consider some, say, microcanonical black hole, which literally just has support on some finite uh, subspace, finite dimension subspace of the CFT. Um, so either way, the idea is that the CFT, the black hole states in the CFT, use a you know, subspace such that the dimension is approximately exponential in the area of the black hole over 4G Newton. So, so this is the dimension of the Hilbert space that describes the physics of the black hole, is the claim. So I mean, this is, this is like the usual lore uh, that existed before ADS-CFT that according to some outside observer, or, you know, the, the, a black hole of area A is just well described as a quantum system with a Hilbert space that's very large, a Hilbert space of area, I mean, of dimension e to the A over 4G. And ADS-CFT makes this very rigorous because the subspace that you need of the CFT Hilbert space to have a black hole state that you know is well described by normal, say, classical physics. You know, some some microcanonical black hole, say, um, will literally have support in a subspace of the CFT Hilbert space of this dimension. But meanwhile, the Hilbert space of the interior. Um, this is the, the Hilbert space that you might use to describe the modes, the low energy modes in the interior of the black hole in the semi-classical gravity description. This is what I mean by H interior. So H interior is describing Say the low energy modes on this time slice and this description. You know, so this is a, I'm gonna write it here, it's a semi-classical, it's described, it's a Hilbert space of semi-classical degrees of freedom. We need more and more of these, um, this, this, is, this, this is growing with time. This is growing with time because um, the, of the Hawking process. So as time goes on, uh, you have more and more modes, outgoing modes. So if you were to picture it, these are modes just inside the black hole horizon that are trying to 
say, escape the black hole, they're moving outwards, but they're getting redshifted by the potential of the black hole. So they're getting redshifted, and they're getting brought down from the UV uh, to be long wavelength modes. And on this, di on this picture, those are just accumulating. So the number of low energy modes is just growing with time. I mean, and the Hawking process relies on this fact because it's these low energy modes in the interior that are the ones that are entangled with these you know, effective field theory Hawking quanta outside. And so what happens is this is just growing with time. And uh, so the area of the black hole decreases with time. But the, let's say the, uh, so the, 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 the dimension of this, or, or to make it more comparable to this, the log of the dimension of the interior modes uh, grows with time. And so at some point, which is exactly at the page time, the number of interior modes, so the, the Hilbert space of semi-classical gravity describing the interior degrees of freedom uh, is larger than the physical Hilbert space of the black hole. And so the conclusion is that at, the, at this time, and every time afterwards, um, this V must be non-isometric. It must be mapping a larger Hilbert space into a smaller Hilbert space. So it's mapping the state of more degrees of freedom into the state of fewer degrees of freedom. And um, so let me write this out. So, so after the page time, so once, once you have an old black hole, um, this V is what we call non-isometric. And so let me remind you what an isometry is so you know what I mean when I say it's not that. So, um, an isometry, V is, or maybe I'll just use a, a different letter so I'm not getting confused with this V. So my isometry K is, which maps from, say, a Hilbert space A to Hilbert space C, is a linear map such that um, k dagger k equals the identity um, on A. So it maps A to C and then C back to A, and it's just the identity if it does that. So uh, you can prove it's a linear algebra proof. So this is only possible if the dimension of A is at least as big, at, sorry, dimension of C is at least as big as the dimension of A. Um, otherwise, you know, in going from A to C, you have to have some kernel, some subspace of A that's destroyed, and then you can't get that back by acting K dagger. And so the claim here is that the ADS CFT map must be non isometric sometimes. Uh, you know, there's some subspace of HADS on which uh, it's acting non isometrically, and the argument was this one about evaporating black holes. It, it must be non isometric here. So it's mapping from a larger to a smaller Hilbert space. 
And this is perplexing because it therefore must be destroying some information. V must destroy information, right? So whatever the, you know, it has to have some kernel, some, um, some subspace of H interior that it just annihilates in the map to the CFT Hilbert space. And, uh, so whatever information was stored in that subspace is, is just gone. It's irretrievable, which is perplexing because um, you know we we've been saying, or we know the hope is that information is not lost in gravity, um, and the CFT is the full non-perturbative description of what of the physics here is the idea. Um, so how can there be some information that's that's not in the CFT, it would have to be some information that we should perhaps just think of as unphysical. It doesn't really exist. Uh, it's just sort of like fictitious information that, that's present in the semi-classical gravity theory that's somehow not um, physical because it's not uh, information that makes it to the CFT under this map. That might be the word you say, but, but it's a little worrisome because uh, You know, what exactly is the information that's lost in this, in this map? Like, is it, if I just, like, throw my diary into a black hole, uh, is that going to be part of the information that's lost in this map? Oh, we would hope not, because we, we hope that this sort of information, that I, that I, you know, the information that I just throw into a black hole, uh, makes it out into the radiation. That's the expectation. So this is sort of the puzzle. And the, um, let me just tell you our thinking about how this puzzle is resolved. So this is, um, this is a sort of proposed resolution to this puzzle that combines a lot of uh, work from the previous four years, or really going back 15 years or so. And this is, so this is a, a resolution that is sort of a conglomerate of a bunch of ideas, but all put together in this paper by um, me and um, Netta Engelhardt and uh, uh, Dan Harlow, uh, Jeff Pennington, and Shreya Bardhan. Oops. Uh, last year, 22. And the proposed resolution is that, um, you know, maybe even though this weird thing is happening by this ADS to CFT map V, that some information is getting lost, maybe it's the, uh, maybe all the information we care about is not getting lost, and only, only information we don't care about is getting lost. So, um, so the proposal is the following. That uh, yes, there exists a possibly large set of null states or some kernel to V, kernel being the subspace that's annihilated by V. But V acts isometrically, or I should say approximately isometrically, up to um, 
non-perturbatively small errors in GNewton. On the set, on, a, on the set of states we care about, um, which are the set of computationally, for all, yeah, the set of simple states. So, so that, that is to say that if, um, if you had some state psi, of the ADS space and uh, you wondered if it was um, annihilated by this map or to say this better, if you wondered if its inner product was approximately preserved by this map V, it would be if psi is in this, uh, some set of, um, simple states. And the simple states are, um, defined in the sense of computational complexity. So, uh, it's, it's like, you have to pick some reference state, maybe it's the vacuum state, and the set of simple states are all of those that you can do using some number of basic operations, like adding a particle here, flipping a spin there, um, and uh, it's simple only if the number of basic operations you need is polynomial rather than exponential. And I have to tell you, polynomial and what? And that's the uh, entropy of the black hole that's present. So, um, so if there's some black hole around and there's some experiment you want to do, say, on the Hawking radiation or on the black hole itself, and the experiment only requires um, if the experiment requires that you do an exponential number of operations, exponential in the black hole entropy, then uh, all bets are off as far as the encoding of that information that you're probing, meaning that you should not trust the semi-classical description. So if you were to use this picture that we've drawn here that has the gravity description in which, say, in this picture, these modes are very entangled with these guys. Um, if you were to do some exponentially complicated operation, like test what the state is of these guys, say these outside Hawking partners, um, because the, co the operation is exponentially complicated, the claim is uh, it's not guaranteed that um, this picture, so the, informa that the information you're probing in this picture will make it to the fundamental description. Uh, and so your experiments won't necessarily be well described by this picture. Instead, you have to go use the fundamental description. Um, and the converse of this is that if you're doing anything anything simple, a simple experiment, where you just want to say, like, measure the state of seven Hawking quanta, that's an experiment that's not exponentially complicated in the entropy of the black hole. And uh, those experiments would be well described by this picture because the information that you're probing will make it to the fundamental description, so therefore uh, it is physical. So let me just wrap up by saying uh, this is the proposal and the idea, uh, yeah, so given more time, what I would want to do is, is show you 
evidence for this proposal, that this proposal can work, um, by demonstrating to you explicit models in which um, this is realized. So, so I'm not gonna write a whole bunch of stuff uh, given this limited time, but I will say this journey of trying to figure out how reconstruction works in ads CFT uh, led us in particular to here, where we realized there was something, you know, we couldn't reconstruct all operators uh, in the interior of a black hole using the CFT or using radiation or even using both. And we want to know what we can reconstruct and what we can't. And this is actually a subtle question because the map is this non-isometric one. Um, and that might worry you because if it's non-isometric, clearly some things can be reconstructed, some things can't because some information is lost uh, in the map. And you know, we don't have enough control yet over the actual ADS-CFT map to figure out what information is lost and what's not. But we can prove that it's at least mathematically consistent for so-called simple information to be preserved and uh, not necessarily the complicated information. The proof involves some uh, models um, that you know, explicitly demonstrate this. Um, and this, if I had more time, uh, you could tie this back to the black confirmation paradox and say this actually nicely ties together a lot of the lessons we've learned over the past few years. Okay, thank uh, you. Sorry. Uh, so can we say that there are also some very complex states in the CFD part that we also don't have access to? And if we have access to all the very com complex, system, uh, complex states on both sides, uh, the isometry would not be approximate in this time and it would be precise so exact isometry so yeah unfortunately uh, so no it would it's a uh, yeah the idea is that even if you have access to all states in the CFT uh, the map is still non isometric and this is from this counting of Hilbert space dimensions yeah so it's like uh, there must be some states annihilated by this holographic map and uh, the game we're trying to play with this proposal is saying, um, given that, is there some way that physics can still um, you know, uh, work out right? And the answer seems to be yes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm a bit confused on the fact that, so if I understand correctly, this picture is somehow then kind of like semi-classical? Yes. And However, um, the fact that the Hilbert space of, of uh, a black hole should be e to the area over four should still hold in any microscopic theory. Yes. So why are we insisting on saying that there is an Hilbert space on the interior of the black hole and that we have to do to, to find an anisometric map instead of just saying, okay, then probably like you know this counting is just wrong and just yeah, each interior is not. Uh, yeah. So so. I think what you're getting at is a very uh, important possibility to consider, which is that maybe we were wrong just in the, at the level of the semi-classical theory in the way we were counting the number of degrees of freedom. I think that um, that turns out not to be the case. I think if you are careful about it, that you do conclude that the number of degrees of freedom in the semi-classical theory is growing with time. And the, the basic argument is that um, there's a number of ways you could argue it. But, but one of them is that you can look at, in the semi-classical description, right, we, you can do this setup where we extract the modes into the reservoir. And the reservoir you know, is isolated from ADS, so we have no trouble looking at, say, and it's non-gravitational. So we can look at the state of the degrees of freedom there, and the density matrix there looks like maximally entangled with these guys. Um, and it looks so maximally entangled that to be purified by these guys, these guys have to have a very, very large dimension, much larger than E to the A over 4G. Yeah. yeah, good, so the page curve, yeah, so your question was, I'll repeat it because you didn't have the mic, was um, 
isn't what I just said in contradiction with the page curve. So the page curve is the physical entropy. And um, so that's the entropy in what I would call the fundamental description. So like the, the, the fundamental, the true entropy of this radiation is following this page curve. But the state of these modes in the semi-classical description, or what I was, would call the effective description, uh, is this very entangled one. So, so there's, yeah, I, I want to emphasize there's sort of two descriptions. One is what I would call the effective description, and one is the fundamental description. And in the effective description, you can ask what the state is of these guys. And their state is such that their entropy in this effective description follows the Hawking curve, not the page curve that comes down. We know that can't be the true physical answer from many arguments. The true physical answer has to follow the page curve. Uh, and indeed it does. So it's in the fundamental description where these guys have a different um, state, and that state follows the page curve. Maybe let me make this comment, because I don't think I said this, and maybe this is what you're getting at. So this V is a map from ADS states to CFT states, and so it acts trivially on this reservoir. So you might worry that, um, you know, how can everything I'm saying be consistent where in the effective description, these guys look very entropic and in the fundamental description, they look like they have much less entropy because the map between the descriptions just acted like the identity on this Hilbert space. So should it, shouldn't it have not changed the state? And so if it's entropic in one, it should be entropic in the other. And the answer is surprisingly no, because the map from ADS to CFT is non-isometric. It can change the state of any system that was entangled with it. So what's effectively happening is it's quantum teleporting the information that was in the interior outside. So um, yeah, I would be happy with more time, maybe during the discussion to explain what I mean by this, but uh, this is a very nice story. Like, realizing that the map is non-isometric can help explain why in one description this radiation could have a different state than in another description. And the answer is that the non-isometricness actually is crucial to the information um, getting out in the fundamental description. There is still 25 minutes. Still 25 minutes, good, okay. So what I will do is explain to you one of these models. And I think this will help. Okay. So the idea is um, The idea is the following. So we want to define a V that um, maps from a larger Hilbert space to a smaller one. So what it's going to do is we're going to take, we're going to imagine we have um, some number of qubits. Let's call them, uh, let's call these qubits little l. And V is supposed to map from the Hilbert space of little l to the Hilbert space of capital B. And little l, and this is going to be um, the dimension is going to be much bigger than the Hilbert space of B. So we're going to define a map that does this, and we're going to see the properties that it has. And, um, which, will, which I think will be surprising. So, um, so we have these, these guys L, and then we're gonna have some qubits here that we'll call B. Uh, and so the map is gonna sort of act on these guys. It's sort of 
going upwards. So time, uh, you know, time is going up. So we start with these guys. Then the first thing we do in this map is you can tack on some extra system that we'll call F. And it's going to be in some, some initial state we'll call psi 0 F. Then we're going to act a big unitary. And this unitary will be uh, drawn at random. So it's chosen at random. Okay. So um, there's a rigorous way to do this. So if you give me, um, say, some large Hilbert space, uh, you can consider the set of unitaries that act on that Hilbert space, and you can just draw one at random, so you're sort of choosing at random from the so-called Haar measure. So, um, the details of this choice aren't important, but it's a, it's, a, it's a very convenient way to choose things at random, and it actually is well understood how to calculate things, um, like properties of states you get by starting with some state and then acting a random unitary. But because it's unitary, and it's acting on all of these qubits, it outputs the same number. So we had three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It outputs the same number. Um, and B is much, you know, it's just these three. So we have to decide what's going on with these. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, post-select them onto, say, the zero state. So we're going to call these qubits P. So, so uh, sorry if you can't see this. This is a, these qubits are called, I will call them capital P. There's, say, seven qubits in this drawing. And this, this triangle here means that we're post-selecting them. Uh, so, so far, what we have is uh, we started with some state. So we started with some state um, phi on this open space L, and we wanted to act, act V on it. And what that looks like is we took phi, which is on L, we brought in this extra system F that was just in some state psi naught, any state. Then we acted some unitary, which acted on L and F together, so like mixed them up. Uh, and then, afterwards, we're acting with this bra on some number of those qubits, P. So P is, is, you know, it's not just made of qubits from L or made of qubits from F, it's made of some combination. Um, so this is, this is a non-isometric map, because it's mapping a state from, say, a large number of qubits in L to a smaller number in B. But so far, uh, it's not yet the, the full thing that we want because uh, it would typically map normalized states in L to subnormalized states in B. Uh, so to fix that, we need to just multiply it by a number. That's part of the definition. And it turns out the right number is just the square root of the dimension of P. So this is the, this is the Hilbert space dimension of P, and we're taking the square root. And if you do this, so that's, I should write that here. Then the state you, you get defined this way will be uh, normalized on average, very close to normalized, typically. So um, this, is, this is the model. And uh, let me tell you some nice properties. So the first nice property, I'm going to go over here, right? Uh, 
is that um, is that inner products are preserved uh, on average. So there's this, this, this is an equation or an inequality that you can uh, derive. So here we're integrating over all u. So this is some well-defined thing. You're like, integrating over the Haar measure on unitaries. So this is you know, given some compact group. Um, there's a well-defined left and right invariant way to measure and to integrate over it. Um, but those details won't be important. So it's just some measure on the group of unitaries. Uh, that shows up here in the integrands because these Vs are defined that way and depend on U. Um, so let me write this and then I explain it. So the claim here is that uh, this inequality is true. It's something you can derive using this V we have written down. And uh, so here, um, psi 1 and psi 2 are both uh, states uh, in HL. And um, here we have tensored on this extra system R, this capital R, uh, sort of thinking of a similar setup to here, where we don't want to just talk about starting with states uh, that are in L. Sorry, I, I just lied to you. I said this is a state in HL. The state in HL tensor uh, HR. R is some arbitrary reference or reservoir system that we're adding. So this is a state in LR. Um, that we're including for generality. So you can include this extra reference system and this inequality still holds. And we just have to remember that when you act V on the state, uh, it's acting you know, like tensor product with the identity on the R part. And so to map both psi 1 and psi 2 with V, uh, it looks like this. So this is, so here we have the inner product between these two states, psi one and psi two. Here we have their inner product that you get when you first map them into uh, the B Hilbert space or the BR Hilbert space and then take their inner product. And the claim is that, if you forget about the integral for a second, the claim is that um, the inner products are, are very close, right? Because this is the difference in their inner products. So the inner products you would get on the L R system, and the inner products you would get on the capital B R system. And the difference is less than this very small number. It's very small because uh, it's you know one one over the square root of the dimension of capital B. And even though B was smaller than L, it's still some Hilbert space. Uh, with possibly an extremely large dimension. Uh, and so morally, actually, it's like, uh, you know, B is like E to the A black hole over 4G. So this would be like the, the difference in the inner product of the states before and after mapping it are... Uh, suppressed by this amount, like e to the minus a over 4g. And then this average is just saying, this is, you know, it's very e easy to compute these things with these integrals here. Uh, there's some known technology using Weingarten functions. And um, this is just telling you that, uh, in some sense, For almost, yeah, so literally this is just saying that this is true on average over U um, for any two fixed states, psi 1 and psi 2. And then the meat, 
the real thing that you get out is that this implies, uh, with some more work, that um, given any fixed U, that this is true for, almost, for a very large number of psi 1 and psi 2. Okay. But let me actually um, come back to this, that point momentarily. What I want to emphasize right now is that this inequality suggests that V is likely to preserve the psi 1, psi 2 inner product. even if the dimension of HL is much, much bigger than the dimension of HB. This is the claim. And then uh, I will um, sort of explain this in more detail. When do you saturate the inequality? Good, yeah. Uh, there will just typically be some states that are close to saturating it. Uh, actually, I, I, I'm not sure exactly. Um, No, it, yeah, it, it'll be, I'm not sure how close you typically get to saturation. That's a good question. Um, some states will just happen to do better than others. So some states could actually be preserved very well, because we're sort of choosing, if you just choose U at random, so you pick one of these, not doing the whole integral. Um, some states will do very well and have their inner products almost exactly preserved, and some states will do very badly. Um, so, that, yeah, the claim is that yeah, some states could even do horribly here and have the inner product be different by some very large amount, um, but those states are so few and far between that um, they're like measure zero, so they contribute very little to this integral. But uh, the ones that saturate the bounds um, are hard to characterize, I don't know, yeah. Thank you. Tensor, Thomas David V. Yeah, yeah, if you, yeah, V dagger would be something you can read off from this where you just sort of like add to ket P and then do U dagger. But this would not be a, yeah, so. But this V dagger wouldn't return you to the state that um, you started with, typically. Because typically, yeah, you would have support on, yeah. You would, a typical bulk state you put in here would come out with some support on P that wasn't just the zero state, but like had yeah. many other states on these guys, but those would all get killed. Uh, and then doing the V dagger would not put those back in, and so you wouldn't get out the state you started with. So, yeah, if you want to do the inverse map, starting from the CFT and figuring out the ADS state, uh, V dagger won't do it for you. And given V is V dagger uniquely defined, or you have a different option? Like, could I choose state one in P instead of zero in P, and call it V dagger? Um, yeah, given this V that I've written down, V dagger will be defined because this V is just um, some matrix, and so V dagger is just the. Uh, so this V this V is a rectangular matrix, and so V dagger is just you know whatever you get by transposing and complex conjugating. But um, you could define other V's that look like this, but with different post selections. Um, Yeah, I think what I would like to do is uh, give you some intuition that I, I think this inequality is a little hard to parse and where I want to go with it is a little hard to parse unless I give you some intuition um, on what it can mean to, for V to approximately preserve the inner product of two states um, 
even if the input is much larger than the output. And there's a good model for this, which I'll call the phase model. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Here, the complexity of the states didn't play a role, right? Yeah, exactly. It did not play a role. So the, the complexity of the states would come in when I would say, um, yeah, this was some statement that was averaged over Vs. Uh, then you can ask, what are the properties of a typical V? So if I just picked one of them at random, uh, and in fact, you can use this plus some other information, some theorems about uh, measure concentration, to argue what the properties of these typical Vs are. And then the, the answer is that they will preserve the inner products between a large number of states with extremely high probability. Not all states, because that would be impossible. But a large number. And then you can argue that the number of low complexity states is uh, sorry. That, that's the, the set of states whose inner product is preserved by a typical V includes the low complexity states, would be the argument. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So this example is the following. So let's say we have um, our Hilbert space little l, and it's labeled by some index n. And I'm going to define a different map, not this one. It's a simpler one. Uh, but it's going to illustrate some of the qualitative behavior of these non-asymmetric codes. So I'll call this new V, V phase. And what it does is it just maps it to capital B. And this is the definition. So um, just maps this state, like this basis of states indexed by n, to these states of B, where here we have m, and uh, these are some uh, random phases. So these thetas are just random numbers generated from between 0 and 2 pi. Uh, and they're random as a function of n and m. So we're just choosing the set of thetas at random. And then now, you, given this, you can just go ahead and compute as an exercise. Um, what is the inner product between, um, say, two of these states for n and n prime? And if you write it out, you'll say, okay, well, I can just go ahead and um, use this definition to, sorry, this should not be a dagger. Yeah. And uh, this, you, know, you can evaluate this and that one. And it comes out to be you know, 1 over the dimension of B times the square root of M e to the i theta of n comma M minus I theta uh, n prime m so the m's are the same because um, you know we just you got a chronic or delta whenever you um, did this mapping and then took the inner product on the B space and then this is a sum that you can just, you can try and do and the trick is to realize that because these thetas are random as a function of n and m, that this is essentially a random walk. And you know, and you, we know how to sum uh, terms that form a random walk. What you get is, first of all, if n and n prime were the same, then these would be the same. So this would be one for every term. And so you would just sum up uh, you know, the dimension of B terms, all equal to 1. And that would cancel this 1 over B. And so you would just get 1.
But if n is not equal to n prime, then um, now you have the random walk because these don't, in general, cancel. Instead, they, they're just you know, both independently random. Uh, and so you're summing up random phases for, uh, M, for you know, this number of terms. And that means that you get something of typical magnitude square root of the dimension of B. That's the answer for a random walk. And so the square root of the dimension of B over dimension of B gives you something that's uh, of order one over the square root of the dimension of B. And so we see something that is perhaps surprising to us, um, but it's very, it's very true that you know, here, we didn't assume anything about little l being smaller than capital B. So in fact, I want to consider the case where little l has a much larger dimension than capital B. This is still true, um, where th this V phase is, in a sense, acting approximately isometrically on it, right? Even though, even though it's technically not an isometry, it's embedding a larger Hilbert space into a smaller one, it, it, it seems to act approximately isometrically because it preserves the inner product between two states if they were the same, uh, these basis states. And if they were different, then, uh, okay, it's, it no longer, doesn't preserve the inner product exactly, because it's not, this isn't zero, but it's very small. It's one over um, this like square root of the dimension of capital B, so if that was very large, then this would be approximately zero. Okay. So, um, so the idea is that you can find, so I'm gonna erase part of this, I guess. You can find the dimension of HL states in HB that are approximately, uh, whose inner product is approximately preserves. Uh, let me say it that way. Um, Preserved, uh, even if L is much bigger. Um, now, there is a limit to this. L can't be arbitrarily large and have this still be true, um, because then the random walk argument starts to break down. You get these uh, intersecting paths. And the limit is that um, if HL is uh, doubly, when it's, when it's like exponential in the dimension of the Hilbert space, uh, there starts to be a problem. So if it's larger than about exponential in the dimension of capital B, uh, this argument that we used to derive this starts to break down. And then indeed that's a very general phenomenon. So uh, you can embed a, a larger Hilbert space into a smaller one in this approximately isometric way, um, but not something that's exponentially or more large. So, uh, this phase model was supposed to be intuition for how you can embed, in some sense, a larger into a smaller Hilbert space and preserve inner products in an approximate way. Um, so, let me end by saying, um,
if you go back to the static model, it's doing something morally very similar. And the idea is that perhaps ADS-CFT, its map is doing something also morally similar. And uh, the static model, if you use uh, this inequality plus some extra arguments with measure concentration, you can argue the following. I'll write this down and then I'll leave it there. I'm calling the static model as the, mo the V I wrote down that had the random U. So uh, let me just say, okay. this is called the static model because there's also a, so a dynamical model in this paper, which has, it's, it does something very similar but has some dynamics in it. Um, that this was some inequality that, hel that held <coughs> on average over U. Uh, and then you can drop the on average. So this gamma is some order one number. Maybe like a half or something. Uh, it's, it's less than a half, but. And then this is true, you can prove, um, as a supremum over psi one and psi two. Uh, part, uh, if you look at all simple states, psi one and psi two, all computationally simple states, uh, with extremely high probability over the choice of u in the model we wrote down, uh, this inequality can use to hold. So all simple states have their inner product approximately preserved by that model, it is the upshot. And so this model is, an, is a proof of principle that the principle, <laughs> the proposal uh, I wrote down is mathematically consistent. You could have all simple states have their inner product preserved. And so, um, you know, a lot of the, informa the information you care about in ADS can be um, successfully mapped to the CFT, even though a lot of the information, a large part of the Hilbert space is annihilated. Um, so let me leave it there. Thank you for your attention in these lectures. Uh, it's been very fun. Questions? I'm not sure about what I'm saying, but I have a feeling that in both cases, the average must be zero, and it, what you wrote is actually the standard deviation. Uh, this is the average with the absolute value. So, uh, what, uh, what's the measure? Uh, it's Yeah, because it can't be zero because this is an, is a, there are many terms where the difference is finite, and then we're just uh, sort of integrated, summing up a bunch of positive terms. Okay, isn't it square, uh, squared and then square root of all these, or? Uh, no, it's, uh, it's this one. Exactly this yeah. one. What about this one? Is it? Um, because in random walk, the average is zero, but. Sorry, yeah, let's see. It's a standard deviation that is square root of. Um, yeah, this is. If you were to sum this up for different n's and m primes, sorry, I think this is right. Because um, this is, right, this is a random walk in this you know, complex plane. Um, and so, right, so we're not averaging over all choices of theta. It's like we've picked some thetas, some theta as a function of n and m. And so we're, you know, this is some definite um, finite number of terms we're adding up. And so the magnitude will be uh, square root B. Um, it could have some phase. It, and so different, for different n and n prime, it would have a different yeah, phase. And so if you added those all up, you would get more cancellations. But for some, you know, n equals 7 and n prime equals 13, 
uh, this is going to be something that has a magnitude of order, order square root b. And so this is the answer you get when you divide it by b. So, yeah, so I believe this is right, but I'd be happy to talk about it more. Other questions? Okay, if not, thank Chris for the great set of lectures. Thank you.